You know, as the big thing in the news today is this Hurricane Dorian that's, that's closing down on the, the East Coast. And one of the things that you recognize that seasonally this comes around, so it's always going to be the topic of an illustration. When a hurricane hits, it often causes great devastation. And the result in the aftermath is great hunger that takes place. But you know, there's more than just the hunger that takes place of the physical hunger that is a result of a hurricane that has a devastating impact. Oftentimes, burnout and breakdowns occur in people's lives because of hunger that they're pursuing. They're so intent on pursuing the things that seem to be before them that would satisfy is that they will do whatever, they will work so hard, and they end up burning out, breaking down, sometimes trying to fulfill those hungers with things that will ultimately leave them empty, but sometimes trying to fill those hungers which are really good things, but there's a wrong method, there's a wrong approach to getting satisfaction with that thing that is causing hunger. I think of my own life at times when I have been hungry for something that wasn't uh, really according to God's will, it always left emptiness and devastation. And even when I was pursuing the things of God, but trying to do that in my own flesh and strength, it ended up resulting in burnout and breakdown. We all face these challenges. But the Word of God today gives us some encouragement and some perspective as we continue to look at how Jesus surprised the people that he was around constantly. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, and I'm going to read the passage in whole to give it in its context. It's going to be Mark chapter 6, and we're going to be reading verses 30 through 44. Uh, you can read in your Bible, device, or follow along on screen as I read. The apostles turned to Jesus and told him that uh, all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And he took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Let us pray. Lord, your word is timeless. And this isn't just a story about a miracle so long ago in the, the countryside of Israel, but this is a, a message which has relevance for us today. And we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be guiding us and showing us how we can apply these truths in our lives so that we might live differently as a result of an encounter with you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the main idea for today as we look at this passage, it's a, it's a rather long passage, a very uh, familiar miracle. But the main idea that I want you to take away from this passage today, if you forget everything else, remember this. Jesus cares about the deeper hungers of our souls. There are many things that we seek to, to satisfy our lives and our souls, but Jesus cares about the deeper hunger of our souls. Often we can look to the superficial things that satisfy us and fill us up, but Jesus looks beyond the surface to the deeper things of our lives. Now Jesus, he saw and attended to the needs of his disciples by encouraging them through rustic retreats. Now, as we look at this first section in verses 30 through 33, Jesus is proposing a rustic retreat. 
where he says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now remember, last week we saw that Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs of two, and he empowered them to do miraculous things. Well, actually, it was the week before last, because last week was that parenthesis as we studied about John the Baptist. But two weeks ago, we saw Jesus sending the disciples out. Now, after the parenthesis of John the Baptist situation, the disciples come back, and they are, are sharing what's going on. So we see with this rustic retreat, we see two concepts, the importance of ministry reports and the importance of getting away. We're going to look at those one by one. But see, they had a lot of things that they had done. They had a lot of experience that they had encountered. They had seen God work and move not only in their lives, but through them to have an impact in the lives of others. Remember, Jesus sent them out to teach and to preach and to heal. And they had authority over demonic forces as well. And so they had some pretty spectacular things that they encountered because they were empowered and sent out by Jesus. Now they come back. And Jesus sees them. And he cares about them. And he ministers to his disciples. You see, Jesus wasn't just trying to wring every bit of ministry out of these guys that he could. He cared about them deeply. They were his closest friends. And so when he brought them back in, after they had been out ministering, he understood the weight of ministry. He understood the exhaustion that comes. And so he wanted them to share something that would uplift them, to share with one another how they saw God move. So part of this return and, and giving reports is, is they shared about what they had taught and what they had seen. They were celebrating the successes in ministry. You know, often we get so involved in ministry and we're engaged in doing, 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 and we're asking and asking and asking, we rarely take time to look and see what has God done and how can we celebrate the good things that God has done in our ministry and in our lives. Often we are so busy asking and going that we don't take the adequate time to pause and to seek and reflect on the good things that God has done, the successes. Because we often need to be acknowledging the wins in our lives because often there are so many losses, there are so many setbacks, there are so many challenges, there are so many difficulties. We need to take time to report and celebrate the wins because it encourages us in our spirit. It reminds us that God is moving on our behalf and so we can look for the God moments the next time that we go out. Often We'll, we'll ask, well, what is a God moment that you have seen? How have you seen God work in our lives? Because unless we are trying to focus in on that, we might overlook the ways that God has worked because of just the ordinary, ordinary aspect of life. But not only is it good for celebrating success, when you come back and review and report, it's good for sharpening skills. Debriefing in the context of, of, of evaluation helps propel us forward to the next intentional engagement and overcoming obstacles and how can we clarify the message. When the disciples were coming back and reporting, I'm sure that Jesus was able to coach them up and saying, as they shared what they had done and the difficulties, he can say, have you thought about this approach? Well, this person said this and, and, and I didn't know what to say. The disciples could share among themselves and we can benefit one another as we share from our experiences the things that actually cause difficulties for us, and then learn from one another in that process of overcoming. So there's that importance of not only the, the, the celebration, but the sharpening of skills. But it wasn't just about the reports. It wasn't just about the ministry. Jesus cared about the disciples, and that comes out very clearly in verses 32 and 33, where he highlights the importance of getting away. Jesus calls them away to a desolate place, and an eremos, a secluded, solitary wilderness. We see the same language used in the earlier part of Mark when Jesus goes out into the wilderness to fast and pray, to a desolate place. Now you might say, well, that's not much of a retreat. I would much rather go to a five-star hotel to have my retreat where I can get pampered. But the, see, the thing is, is in that five-star hotel, you have a lot of distractions. And part of the, the aspect of renewal and restoration is not just to have a whole bunch of activities, but to, to spend time with God where he can feed into our souls. And so as he took them out to a desolate place, well, one is they probably didn't have any five-star hotels bordering the Sea of Galilee in, in Israel at the day. 
And plus, there were so many demands of ministry upon them. He called them to come away to an isolated place because the, pre the crowds were pressing in on them. People were following them. So they had to try to go to some place where nobody would want to be so they could just relax and not be so occupied with ministering to the needs of people. Now, you might say, isn't this kind of a ministry heresy to say back off from, from doing ministry? Well, there's a balance here. See, the thing is, taking a pause for ministry means that we don't have to do everything, every time, every way. That's why it's important to have a team. So that while some people are doing the ministry, others can pause and, and, and take that retreat for renewal. And uh, that's a very important step. And sometimes you need to, to step away from the ministry so that there can be a filling up. Taking a season away from something so that you can be ready to have ongoing longevity in ministry. However, the other side is not using that as an excuse for never engaging in ministry or for taking a permanent pause from ministry. The reason we take that time away is not so that we can run away, but so that we can recharge and renew for the things that God calls us to do. He calls us to come away so that we can move on to the next mission that he has for us. You know, the rest is at ease from the movement and the, the, the labors to recover the strength. And the relaxation says that they didn't even have the leisure to eat. That's interesting that they use the word leisure. It's a, a word that's used about three times in the Greek New Testament. And it's talking about taking the time or the opportunity. They were so pressed by the crowds that they couldn't even eat because everybody wanted their time so much. And so that's why he calls them away to a desolate place so that they can have the care for the physical bodies, which impacts our emotional well-being, and our spiritual well-being, taking time away. Well, at this point, I would really like to take time to praise those who serve here at Crossview. I think those that are back in the nursery right now or serve regularly in children's ministry, working with our youth, you are serving and you are honoring the Lord with your efforts. And I want to take time right now to say thank you for your service to the Lord. And that's why the rest of us can come alongside and step in so that they can have times away sometime as well. It's a team. We're a family, and we work together. And I'm so thankful for the valuable service to the body that everyone who volunteers that you do at different seasons and different times. I'm so thankful for this body. And working as a team provides that practical function for coverage. But we see that Jesus as he ministered to the, the needs of his disciples, even as he was trying to, to, to make sure that they were doing well, he didn't ignore the needs of the crowds. He saw them, and he was moved deeply by what he saw. And what Jesus saw as this, this crowds were coming back and the disciples were back together and it was getting exciting and there was momentum again, he still saw the condition of the crowd. Even as the disciples came back from great ministry success, Jesus sees the condition of the crowd. Now, picking up in verses 33 through 36, it says, Now many saw them going as they were trying to find this desolate place, and they recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when they got on shore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it, it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is late. Send them away to go to the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. A couple of things here. What's interesting is that the crowd sees them going out in the boat, and then the most interesting thing takes place is they take off on foot. And so what was really taking place is you have the Sea of Galilee. They were going from one point to another about four miles away, but they were taking a boat to get away from the crowds. But the crowd said, hey, if they're going that direction, we know where they're going. And so they did a little uh, 10K fast walking around the border of the Sea of Galilee, gathering a crowd along the way, and then get there. And so, you know, with the Sea of Galilee, the weather could be kind of cantankerous. And so they were, might not have been able to get there as directly and as quickly as possible because of the way the tides and the winds and everything was going. But so it worked out the whole crowd walked all the way around, uh, probably about 10 kilometers compared to the four kilometers that they had to go across, uh, six miles, and were there when they, they, they landed on the shore. Kind of crazy, isn't it? But what that does is that's an indication 
of part of the spiritual condition that they had. And so there's a spiritual perspective to what is taking place here. Jesus, he sees that they are following him. They, they can tell what's going on. And when he arrived on the scene, there is a massive crowd there. And when Jesus sees that crowd, he looks on them. So he had compassion on them. So Jesus sees the crowd. They run after him. They're expending great energy. You know, when I was, uh, I went on a hike yesterday. And so uh, after, you know, hiking a, a couple of miles, it's like, man, I'm hungry because normally I can go a long time without eating. But when you're expending lots of energy, that hunger comes in and that hits really hard. Well, Jesus, he knows that he had spent, they had spent time pursuing him. They were expending energy. And when he sees the crowd, the word, this Greek word that I cannot pronounce, uh, that says he has compassion. He was moved with compassion. It says basically the word describes a feeling in your bowels. It was, he felt in his gut that he had compassion for them. So it was a gut-wrenching type of thing. We use that term, oh, that was gut-wrenching. When you see something horrible takes place, well, Jesus looked on the crowds, and he had a gut-wrenching reaction, a visceral reaction of compassion for them. Now, what would evoke such a strong, visceral reaction from Jesus as they describe this gut-wrenching sensation? He said that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Well, what's so significant about that? Well, a sheep without a shepherd is in a very, very precarious and dangerous situation because sheep, as you have probably heard, are notoriously dumb and can be easily exposed to danger and be exploited by predators. So Jesus looks on these people and he recognizes that they are ripe for the picking by someone who would seek to do them harm. And he says that is not an acceptable situation. He has compassion on them. He sees them in their pain. He sees them in their hunger. He sees them in their distress. And his heart goes out for them. So what does Jesus do? He decides that he is going to teach the sheep, not beat the sheep for being sheep. Yes, they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost. They were in a potentially dangerous situation. But rather than criticizing them for where they were or what they were, he said, I'm going to help them where they are as they are because I love them. Jesus looks on them with compassion, and he teaches them. He said, there's something lacking that allows them to be in this dangerous situation. There's something lacking that allows them to be exploited. And so he speaks to them at their point of need in their spiritual hunger, he teaches them. And it's driven from his love and his compassion for them. You know, that's a question that we have to ask is how do we see ourselves? Do we see ourselves as, as having it all together? Or do we see ourselves as sheep from a standpoint where we don't know it all, we can't do it all, and we need a shepherd? And so we submit to one who is the authority who has the ability to watch over us protect us guide us and direct us and that good shepherd's name is Jesus or do we see ourselves as sheep or do we see ourselves as independent agents and saying you know I really don't need a shepherd to watch over me now the reality is is that we all are sheep because we are vulnerable and we cannot save ourselves and we need the shepherd to watch over us but we're not just sheep because when we have come to Jesus, we have encountered the good shepherd and he has made a transformation in our lives. Yes, we still need him to care for us and watch over us. But now we are under his watch care. So we are receiving his resources. We are receiving his teaching. And so now he takes us as sheep and he transforms us into sheep who are also functioning as shepherds so that we can help others because so that we can say, hey, you know, I understand sheephood, been there, done that, and still am, but I also understand the love of the shepherd and the needs that we have as sheep, so let us turn to the shepherd who can take care of us. You know, I think of uh, the illustration of, of Jonathan Edwards, a famous revivalist uh, from centuries long ago, and he feared that during the Great Awakening, as he was preaching, and as thousands of people were, were coming to Christ and being converted, he had a great fear that it was just a surface conversion, that they were just counterfeit conversions. And he desired that the gospel that he preached would change their lives from the inside out, not from the outside in. 
Well, the outside in change would be, oh, through re religious manipulation resulting in guilt. Oh, well, if I browbeat you and twist your arm enough and beat you with the Bible enough, then you'll act like I want. Or if, um, uh, you know, if I, if I teach it well enough, you know, we have this Bible is powerful and the lo arguments are all logical. It's airtight, and it is. But if I, we get that, then we'll be transformed. But Edwards didn't want that external stuff because the Bible is true and the arguments are solid but if it just stays in our head it doesn't result in a transformed life Edwards wanted people to see the 18 inch shift from the head to the heart where their hearts were burning their hearts were on fire for Jesus yes you have to have the correct doctrine the truth and the information to experience transformation because Jesus is the way the truth and the life that is an intellectual argument but are we going to love the one who is the way the truth and the life is the big question it has to go to the heart and that's where Augustine the the great North African father Augustine of Hippo said we are what we love we are what we love. So what is it that is drawing the affection of your heart? What do you love the most? And that's what you will become. And often we see that many times in, in the world today, people who will give a lip service to Christianity, but their hearts are loving other things. And that is not true conversion. We want to see uh, lives that are changed because the hearts and the affections are all for Jesus and fully for him. Not as an appendage, not as someone who is on the side who is convenient, but at the heart of who we are in our being. This is the condition of the crowd that Jesus sees and that he addresses. It was late, and so their options were limited. That was the experiential reality. And so they were tired, and they were hungry, and they were needing strength and encouragement for the journey. So the question for us right now in our situation is, what are we hungry for? What is your experiential reality that is influencing your affections? Are we exposing our things that will lead our affections away from Jesus? Or are we exposing our things which will lead our affections toward Jesus Christ? Well, that leads us to the Jesus transitions from the needs of his disciples and the needs of the crowd to the deeper things. The crowd that they would move from their experience to the God moments to see where God was working in their lives. So away from the focus of the disciples, away from the focus of the crowd, and begin to focus on God. And that's where we see the third point of the recipe for a miracle in verses 37 through 44. But he answered them. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread to give them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Um, and, and he said, Go and see. Excuse me. And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they, they went and they found out, and they have five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups, about hundreds and by the fifties. Taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up into heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples who set it before the people. And he divided the, the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And he looked, took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of fish. And those who ate the loaves and fish were 5,000 men. Now, I'm going to just sum up. I mean, I spent way too much time, got too excited on the first part. So I'm so, sorry, but I've got to abbreviate this last part because we've got the Lord's Supper. So forgive me for going through this so quickly. We see that he had limited resources. Now, they were facing the reality of money the disciples say hey should we take uh, 200 denarii and go buy some bread well you know 200 denarii that represents 200 days wages at a, at a conservative estimate that's about twelve thousand dollars and with five thousand people that's about two uh five thousand men if we add a few more because there are women and children and go a conservative estimate of six thousand that's about two bucks a person 12,000 bucks and so the disciples were saying in a very gentle way to the to to their their rabbi we ain't got the money to do this. We don't, you know, that's a lot of money. We're not going to be, we don't have the money to do that. They didn't say, Jesus, what are you thinking? We don't have $12,000 to go buy lunch for these people. So they said, hey, should we go buy lunch? It's going to cost about $12,000. And so Jesus says, you feed them. And, uh, and, and they go and, they, and, and, he, and he says, what do you have on hand? What are the resources that you have on hand? And they looked at the five loaves. And those were probably small barley loaves and two small fish. It wasn't even enough to feed themselves, let alone a massive crowd. 
You know, it's interesting when we see these types of things. The question is, there's no way that we're going to get through this. We might ask ourselves, how are we ever going to get through this? But that's when we have to look to the, the way that God operates. It might be through the unexpected increase. It might be through a choice to decrease what we uh, do in some areas so that we have adequate provision in other areas. It might be that God opens another direction that we haven't seen so that he provides for those needs and those hungers and those insurmountable things. Or it might be that we're going to go through a season of refining where we're not having everything that we want. And there might be some suffering because through that suffering, God is going to work into our lives. So we can't put God in a box because he uses a lot of different ways to accomplish his will in our lives. So they lack the money. They lack the food. But Jesus had an expectant organization set up for them. We saw that they understood the realities of the, the, the lacks that they had on their hand, but they also understood another reality, and that is there's a God who is providing. The other reality is that when we look through at things through God's eyes, they look differently than when we look through them through our human eyes. They assessed the goods that they had on hand. He said, what do you have? Now, the thing is, is they didn't have much, five loaves and two fish, but they had something. And God was willing to take what they had, the little that they had, and if they applied faith and trusted him, he could multiply that to do amazing, amazing things. Now, it's interesting that, interesting that he had them said that they, excuse me, it's interesting that he had them sit down. He, he called them to be seated. Now, the word there is uh, anacline, which means to, to recline and to lie down. And so they weren't in a position of, of, of getting for themselves. They were in a position of being served. So he had them sit down so that they could be served. This just makes me think of Psalm 23rd, 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You see, Jesus had them sit down. And it's interesting because Peter describes it as green spaces. Had them sit down on green grass. Think of the good shepherd. Jesus is operating at the good shepherd, and he has them sit down on the green grass. The imagery that this evokes for these Jewish people who know the 23rd Psalm, they might have started to see themselves as the sheep that they were at this moment when he had them sit down on that green grass and was providing for their needs. He sat them down to be served. But it's interesting because in verse 40, uh, it says that, so they sat down by groups of hundreds and fifties. Now, it's interesting because the word that they used in verse 39 is a different word of, of groups, is different from the word of groups in verse 40. In verse 39, it's groups of saying, hey, this is like a drinking party. Sorry, that's the, the, the term that it was. Now, they weren't having a drinking party, but it's more of we're going to sit down to have a meal together in verse 39. When Peter describes it in verse 40, it says they sat down. It was like the bed of a garden. So now these people that are sitting down are to receive the food and eat are perceived as gardens and the uh, flowers in the garden of God. It's a beautiful image here to see how Jesus had compassion and how he was organizing and how he saw the beauty even in the organization. And then what he did was something that was classic. He asked the blessing because even though they had the organizational structure, they recognized that they needed to make a request from God to complete what they were lacking. They had something. They had five loaves and two fish, but God was going to have to intervene. And so Jesus uh, asked them to do something like he had never done before. He didn't ask for the manna from heaven or water from the rock, but what he did say is he said, Baruch ata Adonai Elohenu Melech Ahaulam Hamatso Elechem Min Haleth, which means... Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, sovereign king of the universe, who brings forth the bread of the earth. A very common Hebrew blessing, bring forth the bread of the earth. And then when we see this, we saw an amazing outcome. When they took this faith and they put action to it, God did amazing things. All were satisfied. They ate and were satisfied. They were filled. They were well fed. They were full. But more than that, Jesus was satisfying the deep hunger of their soul, the needs that they had that they couldn't even express or they didn't fully understand, the need to encounter the living God of the universe. And after this event was over, this miracle, which showed the greatness of God and the Messiahship of Jesus, we saw that there were leftovers and they were collected the leftovers. 
Jesus provided an abundance. And there were 12 baskets collected. And I think that was probably for the 12 disciples as a reminder of his provision for them. His partnership with them as they are sheep and now are also shepherds. As they are the ones that Jesus asked to provide for the sheep, provided for them through him. So Jesus involved his disciples in this process of multiplying the bread. So this, this, this hunger game that took place resulted in satisfaction because Jesus met them at their point of need. Jesus cares about you where you are right now today. He cares about the deeper hunger of our souls. He cares about the hunger of your soul. Not just your physical needs, and he cares about those things, but he cares about the deeper needs as well. Will you come to Jesus and experience satisfaction in him? Whether you have never known him as Savior and Lord, will you come to him and put your trust in him to be your Savior, to forgive you of your sins? Or if you do know him, will you trust in him for the needs that you have, and will you make the choice to make your heart's affections towards him? so that he can transform you. We're going to be entering into a time of the Lord's table, but before we do, we're going to close in a word of prayer. Father God, I give you thanks that you love us and that you provide for us and that you satisfy the hunger of our hearts and souls. You are our good shepherd. You look on us with compassion. I pray, Father, that you would help us to see your great love for us and to respond by setting our hearts on you wholeheartedly that we can experience the fullness of joy that comes from walking with you. In Jesus' name, amen.